All right, this is one of my favorite kinds of notebooks to build because it's simple enough that anyone can understand it, but rich enough that you can spend hours playing with it. If you're new to backtesting or quantitative finance, this is actually a perfect starting point. There is one rule, very little code, and every line does something obvious. And if you already know what you're doing, it's a clean sandbox to test how a single idea behaves across different markets. So the goal here isn't to find a magic strategy. It's to build something you can touch, change and break. By the end of this video, you will understand exactly how this rule works, why it behaves very differently depending on the markets and how to modify the notebook to test your own assumptions. This is one of those setups where the learning comes from experimenting, not from me explaining theory. The entire strategy is basically one comparison. Price versus a long-term average, evaluated once per month. That's deliberate. If you can't reason about a strategy this simple, you cannot trust yourself with anything more complex. What I want to test here is not whether this beats the market. I want to see where a very simple trend filter materially changes the risk profile and where it doesn't. To do that, I'm going to apply the exact same rule with fixed parameters to two different ETFs using identical code. Let me quickly walk you through the implementation. I start by pulling daily adjusted close prices for the ETF. What exactly that is, I get to that in a second. Then resample those prices to month end prices. All decisions happen at monthly frequency. From the month end prices, I compute a 12 month simple moving average using a rolling window of 12 observations. That's the only signal in the entire notebook. Each month end, I check whether the price is above or below that average. If it's above, the signal is one. If it's below, the signal is zero. This line here is important. The signal is shifted forward by one month. That means the signal is observed at month end and applied in the following month. So there is no look ahead bias. The first 12 months don't have a moving average yet. So the position is initialized to zero. Monthly market returns are just the percentage change in month and prices. Strategy returns are defined exactly like this line here. Positions times the market return plus one minus position times cash rate divided by 12. So when the strategy is invested, it earns the market return. When it's not invested, it earns the cash return, which in this run is set to 3%, which is very conservative given the current Fed rate. Nothing else is going on here, except as you can see, I'm also keeping track of the maximum drawdown of strategy versus buy and hold. This is the plotting part and we're going to end up with the EEM plot. So this is the EEM history. EEM is by the way, just an emerging market ETF. Buy and hold experiences a maximum drawdown of little over 60%. Imagine that, that's actually crazy. With the trend filter applied, the worst drawdown drops to roughly 24%. This is a significant change. The strategy is invested about 65% of the time. So the rule is selective, but it's not constantly in and out. I'm not claiming this explains why this market behaves the way it does. I'm just observing that for this series, applying a slow trend filter 
materially reshapes the left tail of the return distribution. That's a factual statement about this data. Now, I'm applying the exact same rule, same look back, same execution logic to the S&P 500. So we're scrolling all the way up, change that to the S&P 500 ticker and let everything run until the last cell. By the way, if you want this notebook exactly as it is, so you can run it on your own index and also change the assumptions, it's available in the tier three membership. So this is the S&P 500 ETF, SPY, using the exact same rule and parameters as before. So any difference you see here is coming from the market, not the strategy. And as you can see, it's quite different to the EEM. Buy and hold, the blue line here, compounds steadily over the full sample with relatively fast recoveries after drawdowns. The trend filtered version, the orange line here, still reduces drawdown significantly from around 50% for buy and holds to the mid teens. But the equity curve lags over the long run. When SPY falls hard and stays weak for several months, the strategy exits and avoids part of the decline. That's why the maximum drawdown is much smaller here than for buy and hold. But, and this is the key point here or in general, the trade-off. You can also see the costs. After markets recover, buy and hold immediately compounds again. The trend filtered version often re-enters later, which permanently leaves some upside behind. Those missed recoveries accumulate over time, which is why the long run equity curve ends a bit lower. So on SPY, this rule isn't trying to grow capital faster. It's trading some upside in exchange for smaller drawdowns. Whether that's acceptable depends on what you care about more. Smoother path or maximum growth. Thanks a lot for watching and look forward to see you in the upcoming videos. Cheers. Bye bye.